Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wassalatu wassalam upon all the messengers of Allah without discriminating, of course, between any of them. My dear sisters and my brothers, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome in the third installment about Allah's knowledge and also what he has written, where he has written it and how is that affecting or how can that affect our lives. Before getting started, I want to talk about our relationship with Allah and how we really feel towards Allah. What is that bonding feeling? Do we have it or it's not there? To give you an example, I'm going to use the example of someone who works in a company or two people that work at a company. One of them feels like the company is his. He loves the manager, he loves working in the company, struggles, does everything in their powers so that the company actually is successful, profitable and all. The other member is actually distancing himself. He doesn't feel or she doesn't feel that the company is theirs. They work because they work and they have to work there. So the company is there and they are here. But the only thing that bonds them is that you pay me to do a job. Many Muslims today, in the way Allah has been presented to us, we feel like he is a God up there and we don't have a true relationship with Allah. Even though in Al-Quran Allah has spoken many times about the love between him and his subservient. And he has said that to those who really love him, there are those who truly love Allah and he loves them back. But uh, let me ask you this question. Do you love Allah? Don't tell me yes, okay, because you say yes because you feel like you are compelled to say Allah. But do you really love Allah? Do you feel that love in your heart? Do you feel a bond with Allah? I don't think we do. We kind of like, yes, I love Allah, just like I love my mother, but she's been nasty to me. And I love her as my mother because she is my mother. I don't have that relationship there. And the reason for all this is because Allah has been presented to us differently than what he says he is in Al-Quran. My job is to introduce or reintroduce Allah to you based on what he says in Al-Quran. And this, uh, see, the way our scholars wanted to understand Allah has led us against a wall, a brick wall. And that is because they wanted to keep Allah away from any types of misdoings. Like you give shape to Allah or you think negatively of Allah. And in trying to protect Allah, they ended up by messing up our belief. We feel Allah is there and things like that, but that's that. You pray 20 years and yet you're not yet sure that you're going to go to Jannah. You have no confidence in you in that love. So my dear sisters and my brothers, without going any further than this, you get my drift in here. You, you catch what I'm trying to say here. So has Allah written? Yes, he has written. He said this in Al-Quran. Anyone who does not believe that doesn't believe in Al-Quran. Now, the writing of Allah, where did he write it? And what language did he write with? And this is what we're gonna, what we are studying right now. Allah wrote in something called Al-Kitab. Al-Kitab, when you translate into English or any other language for that matter, refers to a book. And a book in our imagination is that series of pages and uh, you've got uh, the cover at the front, the cover at the back, the back cover, and that's where the book is, is the thing you hold in your hands and you read. But Allah does not mean that and he doesn't mean it at all. You see, a book, if we say it's a book of this or a book of that, or for example, if people play football, they say someone has been booked, or you book a ticket or you to travel, or you book a flat, or you book a film, or you do, you, the booking is an act that you do. So has Allah written? Yes. Where did he write? Well, he explains in the Quran that he wrote in something called Al-Kitab Al-Mubin. Al-Kitab, as I explained before, if you've been following my talks, is a gathering. And that's why Katiba is a platoon of people. Maktaba is the bookshop, is, is the, the shop where you have books. So Al-Kitab is a gathering of certain topics, and all these topics serve a 
perps. So you have a, a, a book for cooking. I, it's a gathering of articles for cooking, for mechanics, for this, for that, for this, for this. But you get the idea. So Allah has written in a book, Al-Kitab, and he explained to us or he told us that Al-Kitab Al-Mubin. Al-Mubin means at any one time, Allah interacts with that book, the book is revealing. It clarifies whatever Allah wants to, uh, to get clarified. It discriminates, it helps with a lot of parameters. Now, you're going to say, oh, does Allah need that? Well, since he has written it in a book, since, well, not the book again, the covers, okay? Since he has trusted his knowledge into a something, then certainly Allah interacts with that. And uh, that book is the place where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps an inventory of the elements of life. You know, everything that the you know, creatures need to survive on this earth. And when I talk about creatures, I mean about the, the tiniest of the bacteria to the biggest of the animal and, uh, animals and passing by human beings. That book or that uh, container that contains what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written keeps track and traces of creation motions, all the creatures motion and and when I'm talking about motion you could be walking but also the drop of a uh, water is uh, moving an atom of oxygen as it moves in the air is actually a motion the whole plane the mountains anything that ever existed or still exists or will exist in the future is actually documented in a book, in a gathering, in a container. And that place, and, and, and that place holds coordinates of virtually anything that exists either here or before, or as I said, in the future. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us about this book, Al-Kitab Al-Mubin, the clarifying book or the container that clarifies. He says it and he says it nicely, concisely and beautifully. He says, وَمَا مِنْ غَائِبَةٍ فِي السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ And there is nothing which is absent in the heavens or the earth. What this means is the things they exist, but they could be absent from you or from the other one or from anybody. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, except that thing there is being recorded in Al-Kitab Al-Mubin. Again, the clarifying container or book. Illa fi kitabin mubin. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that the coordinates of virtually anything that exists real time is recorded as it happens and then that's it and then he moves on so you see now you get a small idea about where Allah keeps the inventory of it all it's in a container that container holds different things in it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about a bunch of people that says that we do not believe that the end of time shall ever come. وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَا تَأْتِينَ السَّاعَ And said those who covered. You see, every time you hear the term kafara, the cover, to cover al-kafir, it, it is not opposite to believe. You see, we have this tendency. Every time we hear the term uh, kafara or something like that, we straightway think uh, us Muslims and those who are not Muslims, they are kuffar. But this is not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. See, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whenever you hear the term kafaru or have covered, okay, kafar is not, it doesn't mean disbelief. It's either Allah has already mentioned what they should have believed in, but they covered that and don't. Or that he mentions them by description, then he mentions what they have not believed in, what they have covered. One very bad habit, again, of us believers in the Quran is that we think every English person out there is a non-believer. And you hear this a lot within the Muslim community, so much so that we refer to the English people or European, American, or anyone as kuffar. <laughs> you, you hear it all the time. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. But is this true? Well, it's not true. Because kufr is a statement in the heart. 
Kafara means the cover, somebody who covers something. English exactly like Arabic. Kafara in Arabic, it's a, a verb in the past, equals cover, to cover something. When Allah talks, is somebody has covered something. So when Allah speaks about the Christians who said that Jesus is either part of the Trinity, or Jesus is God, or Jesus is Son of God, and Allah says, لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ ثَلِثُ ثَلَثَ What Allah says, is they have covered those who say that Jesus or Allah is the third of three. Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay? So what Allah is saying is that every human being within themselves, Allah has put the seed whereby they believe that Allah is one. So when someone says that Allah is three or four or two or whatever, they have covered that belief within them. It does not mean that we Muslims should rule them based on that. Now, why did we end up with this understanding that every English, French or Hindu or Sikh out there is kafir? Well, this is because of the third century when Muslims were we were the superpowers of that time and we wanted to conquer the people and we wanted to establish our supremacy, they labeled anyone that was not a follower of the Quran or Muhammad as a disbeliever and this is the problem with that and we are paying the consequences of this. But anyhow, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when these people said that they don't believe that there will be an hour that the end of time will happen, they shall stand in front of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds back to them, says, قُلْ بَلَى وَرَبِّي لَتَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ No, say to them, no, by my Lord, this hour shall certainly come unto you. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, who says this, right? Well, Allah says, عَالِمِ الْغَيْبِ Allah is the knower of the absent, not the future, the absent. And what gives him the authority to speak such, about such a thing, something that exists and we don't see it? Well, because لا يعزب عنه مثقال ذرة في السماوات ولا في الأرض Not as much as of an atom weight in the heavens or in uh, on earth shifts away from Allah, i.e. escapes his knowledge and gets overlooked. Nothing, absolutely not a thing, gets overlooked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not big one, ولا أصغر من ذلك ولا أكبر. And neither does anything smaller than that or greater. Everything is within Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knowledge. And he said now, إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مُبِينٍ Except that it is in a kitab mubin, i.e. in a clarifying container, a discriminating container. You can read more about this in Surah 34, the Surah 7. So what Allah is telling us here is that world actions are recorded real life as they happen. You see, when a lion attacks a zebra in the savannah, that act is being recorded as it happens and trusted into that book. You see, when the BBC goes, when David Lembra goes there and films these movies, these great documentaries about animals, you see, when the crew is filming the lion as it attacks the zebra, right? They trust it into a camcorder and then onto a tape and then the computer and we get to see it months later. But it's been filmed as it happened. Guess what? Allah also has got a team working on the field and they are doing exactly as the BBC does. So humans actions are recorded or, or all creatures, all creatures are recorded in real life as they happen and our actions, we the humans actions, what we do is also recorded but is also recorded in Al-Kitab Al-Mubin. There you go again another container. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this beautifully in the Quran. He says, Inna rusulana yaktubuna ma tamkurun. Certainly our messengers, i.e. the angels, record that which you can inspire. And Allah is talking here about uh, the, the people that conspire against you. And this is in Surah number 10, Surah Yunus in the Ayah 21. And on judgment, on judgment day, when we stand up in front of Allah, Allah is going to say to us, هَذَا كِتَابُنَا يَنْطِقُ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْحَقِّ Here is our record, our container, that articulates loudly the truth about you. You see, Allah uses the verb yantaq. Yantaq is, is not speak. 
is to make the sound. You see, sado is a feature that only exists with humans. Or, for example, if you take a parrot that talks. Now, his talking is the act of uttering, of pronunciation, intelligibly. I, you can understand it from their mouth. You see, when we are a little kid, when the boy is, when we are born, we we just make sounds. We don't say words. And then, if a kid is not going to talk, the parents start getting concerned because the talk is just making sounds. They have not made nutq. Nutq is, is when they break the silence and start formulating words. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on Judgment Day, He tells us that that kitab, that container, that book, uh, as in a container, shall talk. It actually will emit sounds and it will talk in a manner that you and I will understand it. Now, your computer or your watch or your phone, it does not talk. You see, it plays what has been recorded. But it cannot, you can, we can, humans, no matter how advanced we can, we can never ever make a computer talk from itself. That's impossible. But Allah says on Judgment Day that the book itself will talk just like you and I talk. So you can see here that this book shall be a lively one. And Allah says, Inna kunna nastansikhu ma kuntum ta'maloon. I.e. we were having transcribed what he used to do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has messengers and those messengers are angels that document everything that we do. Angels are writing them down as they happen real time. And uh, that hadith that says when you do something, the angel uh, waits six hours and then they are, that is an absolute lie. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna kunna ma kuntum ta'amalun. We were having transcribed what he used to do. You do it, it gets transcribed. So then w- once you sin or whatever, and then you need to ask Allah to erase that sin because it has been written. If the angels were to wait six hours, then what's the purpose of repentance? You see, that, again, that is uh, the, the hadith and the saying of the scholars. That's why the Quran says something that your acts are being recorded as they happen. But, but to us, no, 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 we wait six hours and so on. So, my sisters and my brothers, we must pay a huge attention to the expression, ma kuntum ta'malun, what you used to do. You see, because angels only write what they see. But they have absolutely no clue about our intentions. So while angels are busy writing our acts and actions and everything, Allah at the same time is documenting and recording our intentions and our most inner thoughts. So as we are doing an act, it gets recorded twice. The act of what we are doing and then Allah documents the intention. And on judgment day, both books get together and then uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put in our book our intentions and everything and then it flies to us and then we go meet Allah with our book in hand. The question that begs to be asked, how many books are there then? How many did Allah mention in the Quran? Well, as far as the Quran is concerned and as far as you and I are concerned, there are only two books. And the first one is Al Imam Al Mubin, and that is the clarif or the preceding clarifying book. What I mean by this, you see, the book in which humanity's actions is collected is called Al Imam Al Mubin. Just like the Imam in the Masjid is the person that stands at the forefront, and we all stand behind them. And we perform the Salat. Al-Um, which is the mother, is called Al-Um. Because it's the same term, same root word as Imam. Imam is in the front. Because the mother comes before the baby, she is called the front. That's all there is to it. So Al-Imam Al-Mubin exists right now, is with Allah. And that's the book where all actions, you see, when we do our acts, remember Allah is writing at the same time as the angels, Allah writes in your own database what you have, the feelings on all, and then the angels bring what you have done, and it all gets compiled in that book that is preceding you. Why it's preceding you? Because it's there waiting for us. We live on earth today, but it's preceding us. When we die, we find it in front of us. So Again, the book in which humanity's actions 
or any, for that matter, any other, the jinn and uh, animals, and everything is collected in Al-Imam Al-Mubin. It is from this book, as I said, that later on, inshallah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fills the other book that he's going to send to us uh, on Judgment Day, and then we get that book, and then we go meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, this is the first book you must be concerned with. You mu- and that book, my dear sisters and my brother, holds us accountable to the atom. Make sure the other, the, you know, uh, sometimes I receive jokes from people, religious jokes, and they actually are against the teachings of Islam. And people just laugh at them and they don't pay attention. But the moment your eyes meet that joke, that act is recorded by the angels and recorded by Allah. You don't pay much attention to it, no problem. But you know what? أحصاه الله ونساه الله سبحانه وتعالى as he says in the Quran keeps a precise track of that and you forget it and on judgment day I, you find something oh and it's blasphemous and you laughed at it and Allah is going to tell you why did you do that and you can't tell him oh I was just kidding you remember Allah says in the Quran وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَى whoever does an atom weight of goodness shall see it and whoever does an atom good of evil shall also see it so you really want to be extremely extremely cautious about uh, what you do but you know so that is the first book Right? The second book is Al-Kitab Al-Mubin and the one or the clarifying book or discriminating book. And this is the book in, or the container in which Allah has written all laws that are necessary to life. How trees grow, how babies are made, how humans eat, the money, the wealth, the air, whatever exists, the cold, how the temperature, all the results of the experiments that we humans make are nothing else but to reach what is already decided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It also carries a lot about the hereafter and uh, how Allah has planned the hereafter, who, how he's going to run it, what people do, all that kind of stuff is already recorded. And because Allah has all the plans laid down in front of him, and how he, for example, on the, how he's going to run judgment day, it's already written in front of Allah. How he, he intends to build hellfire, is or the whole plan is right in front of Allah. How he intends to build paradise, it all is in front of him. He also knows how humanity shall react or shall say or shall feel either in paradise or in hellfire. You see, when Allah tells us in the Quran that some people say or do or they will cry, oh Allah, uh, do this, do that for us, nothing has happened of the hereafter. Allah doesn't see the hereafter. Okay, but because Allah has already planned how hellfire is going to be made, Allah knows the human interaction. Just like a chef who cooks a nice meal, he can anticipate what people shall say. Uh, If an architect designs a beautiful building, he can anticipate what people will say about the the, the things that people are going to say. If a soccer player uh, scores a goal, you can anticipate what people will say. That's because we humans, we build the future based on the past. And the same thing is done by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here's a golden hint that I'm going to share with you. The book in which Allah poured all that life needs to exist is called Al-Kitab Al-Mubin. Every law that you can think about is already written in that book. And I talk about everything, even if the wind blows from the east, how the trees are going to react, in which direction uh, the, the leaves are going to fly, on, uh, how much wind is needed for a, a tree to fall or for a leaf to fall, is already documented in that book. Now, the book, <laughs> subhanAllah, this is called the book of life. Let's call him Al-Kitab al mubin the container, uh, the clarifying container that talks about everything. Strangely enough, and this is the kicker, Allah equally calls the mighty Quran as Al-Kitab Al-Mubin, the clarifying book. And simply put, without too much philosophy in this, my dear my brothers, the Quran is the book that brings all processes that you need to get into Jannah. 
Therefore, there are two books that matter to us, one that precedes us and the one with which life is run. The high book that is with Allah, which holds all the inventory of everything that is in the heaven, the earth, the angels, and everything, and the high book that is with us, from Allah to us, that is the Quran, both of them are in perfect harmony. This is why if you get both books on your side, you will enter Jannah no matter what. But if one of the two books is not with you, then you are cooked. And uh, success on Judgment Day is based on these two things. On how close you follow the Quran, and how close you follow the container of the laws of life that Allah calls Al-Kitab Al-Mubin. Again, to access the high book of creation that is with Allah, to understand how it works, how it functions, how Allah is running the entire creation as we know or hear of it or understand it, and uh, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will run the hereafter, well, all you have to do is look at two facts. The Quran and life itself, all the experiments, all what you see in life, actually points back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A question I get asked, can dua change our decree? Many times I hear people saying uh, this question, can dua change our decree? And uh, sometimes it's worse really. Uh, when you, uh, sometimes I hear in Ramadan uh, in Mecca when they make the dua after they pray the tarawih, and I heard it also in the masjid when I used to go to, for tarawih, and uh, after a long, 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 long dua, you hear an imam in the last rak'ah uh, who just recited, Allah knows how much Quran they recited, okay? And then they turn around and accuse Allah by saying, Ya Allah, we ask of you that if you have written our names amongst the people of hellfire, we beg of you to erase those names and make us of the people of paradise. To this imam and to the whole masjid, be that in Mecca or be that anywhere in the world, what they have said, and this imam memorizes the Quran, okay? To them, uh, it's okay, it's normal what they said. That if Allah has written their names amongst the, the dwellers of hellfire, uh, no big deal, ya Allah, please help uh, change that. And yet in the Quran, Allah says, I have not written anything. How come an imam who thinks like they memorize the Quran and their scholars and things like that miss this big point? Well, the reason being is that they are following the man-made uh, Islam, not the Quran Islam. Because once you connect to the Quran, you will start seeing a lot of things are absolutely wrong. Now, the answer to this question, can dec uh, our dua change our decree? You will find it, inshallah, at the end of this part here. I will deal with that and only then you will understand what I mean. Now, the biggest surprise ever, a surprise that's going to help you to rediscover Allah, it's almost like you lived with a family for 20 years and you loved the man and the woman and you called them dad and they were so much loving for you and everything. Then one day they call you and they say, you know what, we're not your parents. So now it's going to be a shock. And then the question is going to be, oh, who are my parents? And then suddenly your entire life will evolve around finding out who your parents are. Okay, well, what I'm going to share with you now and in the next talk when I talk about Allah in the future, but at least now, is going to help you rediscover Allah like you have never ever have before. And hopefully for you, just like it did for me, it will bring Allah closer to you to a complete different level like you've never ever ever experienced this relationship with Allah. And even though Allah has clearly, openly, directly and repeatedly talked to us about his knowledge and how he manages this world, he also told us how he will manage the next world to come. Our scholar, the problem again always goes back to our sheikh and our scholars who have chosen to ignore Al-Quran, the words of Allah, the speech of Allah, the personal message of Allah to you and to me. And they created for us uh, a complete different set of religion uh, based on the hadith and the scholars and that school of that school of us and all. And by doing that, they created for us this distant deity, this very far God. He is out there. 
okay? And uh, he just, oh, God Almighty, my head is getting there. And then uh, they want us to, to believe in Allah, love him, but it does not work. Here's my dear sisters, I'm a brother, Allah's knowledge. As Allah said it in Al-Quran. And then I will explain. Okay? Ready? Get your pen ready. Allah's knowledge is numerical. Otherwise known as digital. In other words, Allah's knowledge is math. Calculation, maths. Yes, mathematics. That's what you have heard from me. I will say it again. Allah's knowledge is a numerical numbers. Else known as digital or digits, one, two, three, four, five. In other words, math. Once you understand this reality, you will understand why Allah can carry on creating until eternity never comes and Allah will never ever run out of options of creation. Why Allah can keep creating humans and none of them will ever look like any. You see, if we were, if this life was to exist, uh, okay, I'm gonna just going to give like a, a trillions upon trillions upon trillions upon gazillions of millions of billions of trillions, n eternity never comes. Guess what? Allah will never ever run out of creation and he will always carry on creating a human. Each human has never existed. Each cat has never existed. Anything that he creates never exists. Do you know why? Because Allah creates based on math. Let me give you an, uh, ask you a question. What is the last number that humanity can reach while counting? Okay, you're going to say math never ends, counting never ends. Because if you say, oh, this is the last number, well, someone comes here and says, add one, add two, add three, add four, add five, add six. And you, math has, doesn't, counting does not have an end. And that is exactly why Allah's knowledge is mathematical. Okay, now this is the bomb. Now la let's go and take the journey in understanding how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us about his knowledge and how he we missed the boat. Instead of understanding Allah telling us about his knowledge, why we ended up with some kind of this taboo God out there and we actually never ever got to understand Allah as he wanted us to. Again, if life had no end, if eternity was possible on earth, Allah will keep again, keep creating eternally without ever running out of option. If life had no end, if eternity would never ever come, okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can keep creating humans, animals, donkeys, lions, dogs, cats, eternally without ever running of options. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can keep creating atoms upon atoms of anything and he will never ever run out of option. Okay? And we will figure out how Allah does things, how, ever, how he knows about anything, anytime, anywhere. And uh, when our dua is, is, is made to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, can it work against the so-called Qadr? And why the whole concept about this dua is, and Qadr are completely flawed? Okay? How do you fall sick? How does Allah cure us? How does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala know when, where, how, and uh, you will die? Again, the when is not about the time. Your death is not decided. Okay? But I'm talking more about when the time comes for us to leave earth. Just like Johnny Cash said uh, uh, when he sang like um, a song, it's a beautiful song called Hurt. And he talks about his life as, and he goes, I know that at one point we all shall go. Please listen to it. It's heard by Johnny Cash. It's a beautiful uh, song. But anyhow, how does Allah figure out what we are going to do and those children that we get? How does Allah know which one is going to be ours? And uh, if, uh, you see, I am one person, I marry one woman, right? Imagine if, uh, I'm just going to be here spitballing, okay? If I could marry 
10,000 women, and with each one of them I have a child. How does Allah know which of the children is going to be mine? How does he calculate the looks of those children? It's, it's mind-blowing, my dear sisters. How does Allah know what particles of dust will travel with the wind, uh, where it will land, what will, how it will affect, uh, and all those things. It's, it's, it's incredible how much uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does with the maths that he does. My dear sisters and my brothers, I can hear you saying, you just said math, and the math we study at the university, and I will say, yes, that's the math I'm talking about. Okay, so let's go step by step, and I shall, and everything shall become clear, because once you understand Allah's way of doing things, how he plans them, how he runs and manages life. You will then truly understand him and then you will love him and respect him and appreciate him far more than you ever did. But first of all, how are we and the rest of the world? And when I say the rest of the world, I'm talking about animals, materials, nature, everything that you think of and you don't think of. How is all this created? And to answer this, we need to start from the understanding that numbers do not have an end. And so is Allah's knowledge. Allah's knowledge, just like math, doesn't have an end. Now, this is why he says in the Quran, Inna kulla shay'in khalaqnahu biqadar. We indeed created everything and everything in this life and in the hereafter. Allah says he created it with a quantum. I.e. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just look at it, look at the world around you. Give me one thing that has been made or that can be made, not made according to some sort of measurement. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Everything around as is created, and I'm talking created by Allah, according to a quantum, a measurement. The only thing that, never, that does not follow the laws of quantum is Allah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's incredible. Everything else is following the law of quantum. Exact measure. In another ayah in Surah Al-Furqan, that is Surah number 25, Allah says, خَلَقَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ فَقَدَّرَهُ تَقْدِيرًا He created everything and he measured it exactly according to its due measurements. Now, those due measurements, like those quantum, sometimes the humans, you know, that someone who's six feet tall, the other one two feet tall, the lion could be this, the shark could be that, Everything that you see on earth, if somebody is six feet tall, uh, tall, it's because Allah has designed if that uh, for to reach that length or that height, a human has to have this, and then the human gets to six feet tall or whatever it is. Okay, so basically, what Allah is saying is that He created everything after he done some measurement Allah did some measurement and then he put that on earth and he ensured that things are in harmony with the rest of the world for example humans you, no way can we see for example one day uh, a 20 feet tall a guy or a human why? Because he's the proportion, how Allah proportioned us is we all are relative to each other. We're close to each other. Okay? Therefore, my dear sisters and my brother, Al-Qadr means quantum or proportion, but never, ever predestiny. The only meaning that Al-Qadr does not mean is predestiny. So how did this sneak its way into us? Well, guess what? In the Torah and in the Bible, the rabbis and the priests and everything, and the church and the synagogue, all these things, what they did, they misinterpreted because we do not have the original Torah. We do not have the original gospel. So the real language of those, they don't exist in our times now. So what happened is they misinterpreted the term of Al-Qadr and they accused Allah of having plotted everything, designed everything. So 
So when in the Torah for the Jews and the Bible for the Christians, they believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had predestined everything, Allah sent Al-Quran to tell us, no, I have nothing to do with your actions. I have written nothing on you. What I have written on you, he mentioned it in Al-Quran and we shall see what Allah has written certain things. So my dear sisters and my brothers, when you look up for the meaning of this precise term and this truth about Al-Qadr, Allah has laid it bare right in front of our very eyes. But you find that our scholars and those who translated the meaning of this ayah in the English books that you have in your hands, what they did is they restricted the meaning away from what Allah wanted to tell us personally by his own persona, him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they summarized this into saying that Allah created things and everything according to his predestination. In other terms, they say that Allah knew you before even created you and he knew what you were going to do. So all he did was write down what you were going to do and you're doing it because he knew it. So basically you're doing what Allah knew and you can't, <laughs> you get even lost in this kind of nonsense. In other terms, they say, well, you know what? Allah has knew that this animal would fit better as a zebra. And as such, he created it as a zebra. But that's not the truth. Literally, what they put in out there is that they say that Allah has created... They are the scholars, okay? Or what is being preached there in the hadith and the scholarly way is that they say that Allah created things according to what he wrote in the book of the decrees, i.e. Allah al-Mahfuz, okay? And preserved tarbid. And by doing this, they have changed Allah's intent and created a world of confusion. The Quran says white, the hadith and sins of the scholars say other colors. And on judgment day, a lot of people will be surprised. Because if you ask people to prove from the Quran that Allah has already decided what we're going to be doing, they will never ever come up with an evidence. By by changing and manipulating the meanings of the ayat, they will find tons and tons of this nonsense. Basically, it's what you see around you in the world. SubhanAllah. I have difficulties with my brothers, with my uh, my siblings, okay? Uh, my kids, alhamdulillah, and, uh, now things have changed. But my family, everything they say, they say, you know what? What is written in the forehead, the eyes shall see it. If, a pro if the car breaks down, oh, this is what Allah has decreed. I'm like, what do you mean? This is you didn't service your car. You didn't take care of your car. You never ever cared about making sure that your car doesn't break down. And when it breaks down, you tell me, this is what Allah has written? What's wrong? You, the, I mean, Allah broke your car. And, and again, you get into this kind of like argument. And sometimes you feel like you're banging your head against the wall. You tell them Allah says in the Quran, but they tell you, oh, there is a hadith. I've already told you the hadith. The scholars say this. And then they come up again. How come all these people didn't see it and you saw it? But it's not me. It's in the Quran. But anyhow, uh, but, uh, anyhow the, all that explanation, my dear my brothers, are absolutely untrue. What Allah says is that he indeed has and still creates everything with quantum. Every single minute of the day Allah is creating based on proportion, quantums and everything. I'll explain more in a bit. But you know, throughout the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has many times mentioned that he has created and still created based with math and calculation. In other words, Everything that existed in the past, or exists now, or shall exist in the future, is based on an equation. And it's, it's incredible. Look at it. How life goes on. One man plus one woman equals one baby, right? Well, there you go. <laughs> one driver plus one car equals motion. One lion plus one zebra, life goes on. And you can always add. Everything, as you know, everything as you know it, or don't know it, moves with coordinates. You know, we just don't move like that on earth. For me and for you, we're just walking or driving or running or things like that. But to Allah, we are moving with exact coordinates. Because in Allah's knowledge, He created everything in coordinates. Allah says in the Quran, عَلَّمَ الْإِنسَانَ مَا لَمْ يَعْلَمْ Allah taught the man, the man, that which the man didn't know himself. How does Allah 
must teach us. Well, there is this debate in philosophy. They say, when you teach somebody, do you bring new information to them or do you help them discover an information that exists in them? Well, as it turns out, you never ever teach someone something they didn't know. All you do is you help them discover what already is out there and that it is in them. So, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala w- uh, wanted to teach us coordinates, guess what? He runs the world with coordinates. Wherever you are at any one moment, you are in a degree, la- longitude, latitude, and all these things, right? Guess what? He taught us with the advancement of technology today, location. You know, on your phone, where you uh, put on your phone that uh, location, that uh, everything. So when you move, when you're using Google to move map, Google map, and you're driving, how does Google map tell you turn right or sat nav and things like that? It's because someone is calculating our coordinates and is real time updating them at some server, and the server is feeding back the information to our phone and tells us exactly where we're at. And in other words, my sisters and my brothers, in an axis of motion in 2D, okay, well, on your phone, you look on your phone, it's not a three dimension, okay, there is no depth, it's just the X and the Y. The X on the Y, I'm sure you've studied this in math, right, and you hate that because you did not understand, but it's not your fault, it's the fault of the teachers who didn't know how to read the information to you. You see, math are abstract, you don't touch math. Math and calculation are at least a hundred years away from reality. You see, in the laboratories of mathematicians now, the idea of moving, you see, when you send a fax, you put it in one machine and it goes down the line and then it goes to the other end of the world and comes out from a phone line and it prints on a piece of paper. Well, now on paper, on the math, we can transfer a human being. Remember um, uh, Star Trek, beam me up, Scotty, where they stand on that thing and they get beamed out, right? Well, that on paper, on math, this is possible. Now, how can we bring what's on, uh, in, on math to reality? That's where we humans are far behind. In the States now, they have managed to move a chair only three meters. They faxed a chair. It got completely disintegrated from one end and straight away built on one end and it, the distance was only three meters. What this means is maybe in 100 years, 200 years, we will be able to fax cars to send, to disintegrate them in one part of the world and they go all the way sent to America and then they will be all rebuilt through from that disintegration into the car that you sent from Australia. The question is... Are we humans going to do that one day to us? Well, the math, mathematically, it's possible. But now can we do it? We don't. We don't know. It's going to take a long, long time. So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us uh, nowadays, that in 2D world, in the world of 2D print, just like flat world, you have an X and a Y. And anyone who studies maths, you, 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 the curve as you draw it and all these things, on, you look at the, the, the equations on paper, you've got no clue what the teacher is talking about, right? Or the science is thinking. But to a mathematician, it's a complete different world. Let me give you an example. On your computer, the screen of your computer, or as anyone has got a mobile uh, device this year, so, uh, the, in these days, your phone. When you look at your phone, on your phone is a 2D. Your phone, from the bottom to the up, that's where the X is. And then from the left to the right, that's where the Y is. Everything else, the apps and when you write a text on your WhatsApp and all these things, needs coordinates on the screen and your telephone calculates these coordinates real time to place the A where you do it or the picture where you do it or YouTube where you do it and all these things are calculated on time. This is what you, what you create on your phone is exactly what Allah has created but in real we can create virtual things, but Allah can create them real. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran wants us to become godly, Rabbaniyin, and a Rabb is the one who creates, Allah wanted us to create just like he did. That's how he wants it, and that's the power of what he has given to humans. 
this is why killing one human is like you have killed all the entire humanity because in the sight of Allah when he made us humans he gave us so many things from him but at a very very reduced degree Allah is wise he gave us wisdom Allah is merciful he gave us mercy Allah is powerful he gave us power Allah is strong he gave us strength Allah has a life he is living Al-Hayy, Allah is Al-Hayy, the alive. He gave us life. Allah gave us sleeping, but He doesn't sleep because sleeping is a sign of weakness. And Allah didn't give to Himself, He gave it to us. Allah gets angry, He gave us anger. Allah gets deceived and He gave us the deception. Allah gets loving. Allah and he gave us love. Allah loves to be loved and he gave us the love to be loved. Allah gave, wants to be appreciated and loves to be appreciated. That's why he gave it to us. Everything that you see in a human being, attributes I'm talking here, not creation. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has it for himself and we are, as they have said, a small projection of the abilities of Allah on earth. He is the At most, he is the incredible, limitless, and we are the very incredible, limited. That's why we are who we are. For any three-dimensional structure, we need to the X and Y, we need the Z. Uh, the Z. In a box, the box that we have is a... You see, X, Y, and uh, Z, they are just parameters. And then you replace them. For example, when we have a box... The X could become the height, and the Y could become uh, high the width, and then the Z, the Z becomes the depth, and that's how you create a 3D. For domes and circles, it's another set of equation. Then the higher, for higher dimensions, where uh, you have X, Y, Z, and other letters that help make the shapes. Then you have quadrants, and you have octants, and this is where a two-dimensional uh, Cartesian system Uh, the way it is, div um, uh, this is my math going back to me now, okay? Uh, where we have this, uh, the Cartesian system divides the plane, any plane, any platform, into four infinite regions. And these infinite regions, they are into four, they are called the quadrants, and each one is bounded by two half axis. You see how it gets complicated math already, just talking to a bit? Well, guess what? That's why we can never ever comprehend the knowledge of Allah, because it's pure math. It's pure mathematical. And to a certain degree that we cannot comprehend. Allah gave us hint in Al-Quran. The moon and the sun move according to a calculation. Shams wal qamar bi husban. The day of resurrection is yawm al-hisab. The day of accountability. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Al-Quran gives the, uh, he knows how much rain is going to fall, how much well, how, when you're going to die, again it's calculation of time. Allah has spoken about different things. It's just we refuse to listen to him and we went and created this predestiny. But anyhow, as you can see, things start getting, a, you start getting a headache and math generates a lot of headaches for a lot of people and this is what math is anyway. That's why whenever in Hollywood or any cartoons or anything, whenever they talk about math, they bring this, uh, the, this professor with the hair is in all kinds of things, like he doesn't, like the mad scientist, the mad professor, and uh, he doesn't have time to take care of himself because once you get in math, once you taste the beauty of math, once, oh God, you, you, you will forget the entire world because with math, you can create absolutely incredible elements. I'll tell you with math what you can do, okay? You, if you have any graphic design or you have video editing or anything, with your computer today, with Photoshop, you can create some absolutely beautiful uh, pictures and some designs. It's incredible, right? You can't blow life in these, but Allah does the same thing. He plans, he creates, he designs, and then does what? Creates life, it becomes real. We can't make it real. That's why we have special effects on television. They make a human turn into wolf. Can we do it in real? We cannot. We use special effects. It gives us an impression of what we can do, but we can't do it for real. Guess what? Allah can do and does it for real. So let us find what type of math Allah uses. And I'm going to start first with the calculation. And I'll tell you this. Allah is constantly 
calculating every second of the day Allah is calculating you see when your heart beats uh, say a hundred beatings every minute I'm just giving a digit here right who da- who makes the heart beat Allah who calculated what the heart should beat Allah just as two uh, chess world you see if you have two chess players world champions when they play they don't just make the move they are constantly calculating the odds and probabilities of their next move and how that next move can and might affect the running of the game if they're gonna win or they're gonna lose or everything right well the same thing Allah is constantly doing the same but incredibly complex calculations Every, you see, when, I, when you move your hand, you move the... Well, right, right now, I'm talking, I'm moving my hand. I don't think about the motion of my hand. I'm just moving it. But Allah is making that motion possible because He has calculated all the probabilities where my hand is going to move and He has created the coordinates for that hand. And my hand moves in the sphere, in the world, in the spectrum that Allah has designed. If Allah has not designed something for the hand to move into some form, then the hand cannot move. That's why we can't twist our hand to the back uh, inside because it's impossible. Why? Because Allah has not done that. The only way to do it is break your own hand. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is constantly doing the same. And He is always compl- uh, calculating and He uses some complex equations and these equations they contain many parameters to us an equation with four parameters is already a tough one but to Allah one equation could could have a limitless number of parameters and Allah still finds the results of that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ar-Rahman and that is the Surah number 555 in the Ayah 29 29 يَسْأَلُهُ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Whoever in the heaven and the earth asks Allah. Angels ask everything that you can think. Other cre- creatures in the heavens out there, we all cre- uh, are asking Allah. Be that angels, be that aliens, be what everyone to name them. Us animals, everybody is asking of Allah something. Okay, and then Allah says, "Kulla yawmin huwa fi shan." Every day he is upon some momentous affairs. Allah, you see, this ayah truly reveals how Allah is busy working every single day. Don't think Allah is just uh, out there and uh, sitting down and just watching out because He's already done everything. No, 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 no. As Allah is actively contributing to life as we know it everywhere up in the heavens in the unseen world of the angels and also in the cosmos and also with us this is why he calls himself rab you see when we say rabbul alamin we just translate into the lord and we move on but allah does not mean it as simple as that because to Allah the world Arab, he says Rabbul Alameen, Rabbul Nas, right? The term Arab originates from the root word of Araba, from Riba. You see, Riba is the increase. So the Rabb is the one who increased. By increases in what? Well, as it turns out, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that he is Rabbul Alameen, because he increasingly increases whatever the world needs humanity at one point on uh, in time were probably a thousand people on earth well what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created for them the sustenance animals and everything was in relation relative to that thousand people but now we are almost eight billion that the calculation of Allah is continuously working Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is continuously working creating and always fulfilling the needs of what is out there that he has created. This is why the term tarbiya or the education comes from helping the kid to grow. 
Okay, so now when Allah increases as Rabbul Alameen, He increases and you fill the gap with whatever you are uh, asking Allah of. You see, look at that. You, we ask Allah of something we don't have. So when Allah gives it to us, He has increased us with that something. That's the term Rabbul al Alameen. So for Allah to be Rabbul Alameen, He has to help this world increase in whatever is needed, but according to laws and rules that He has determined before creation. What this means, my dear sisters, in order for Allah to help the world and all that exists within it or out of it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to all the needs of people. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bestow upon you a million dollars? Now the question is, why doesn't Allah refer, give you that million dollars? What's holding Allah from doing that? Can't he do that? Of course he can. He can and do it anytime he wants to, he will do it. But because Allah has created everything according to calculation, Allah doesn't do something out of thin air of nothing. For Allah to do something, and before doing anything, Allah take, uh, takes into account many other factors. Well, I'm coming to the hour right now. I'm going to stop right now, and I will carry on, inshallah, in, this, uh, in the upcoming part, and that is 3.1, inshallah, uh, to the next talk, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.